cellar okay got a bunch of pages of stuff to go through tonight so we'll get right at it um, today's my two weeks after my second shot day but both my granddaughters tested positive on the 11th so I'm in quarantine for another two days Okay, regarding Deity's book, makes sense. In all my years of playing, we've never become powerful enough to actually take on the gods. So, mission accomplished. And then we have an interesting question. Is there some kind of support? Is there is there a way to give some kind of support to the channel? <laughs> have all your friends watch. Um, I'm still trying to get an energy drink sponsor. <laughs> all right. How do I feel about thieves? I understand that they came about as someone's homebrew idea that Gygax and others liked. Yeah, the homebrew guy came from uh, my group out of Carbondale, as I recall. Um, in hindsight, there's a good amount of people now who are saying the thief is the worst thing that happened to D&D. Right, they changed the name to Rogue. Um, you got to remember, there was a whole lot of love for Faffer and the Mouser. Uh, and... Um, Jack Vance and Cougar the Clever, and they, there was just a whole lot of love for those characters. Um, they're saying it's the worst thing that happened to D and D that before its inclusion, everyone was a thief, and that it's also led us down the dark and twisted path of character skills. Well, it was it was always the one <clears throat> in the early days when everything was tongue in cheek. Because we were all just having fun doing this thing before it became a lifestyle for some people. The thief was the the thief evolved as the guy that was handy and clever at at, at finding finding booby traps and that um keeping in mind the fiction that we were reading, the movies that were out at the time, etc. Um it could be argued that yes, the thieves' certain abilities did become an impetus, an in, impetus to find a better way to handle them. Now, the fact that they went into skills and abilities just horrified me, but I understand the drive to do something like that. I just didn't think they did it badly. Um, before there was a thief in my group of Carbondale, we had Hobbit. He was just, he just was really good at rolling things and um, the only time he ever did have a mishap, he made a save, um, which we're going to talk about saves later tonight in another context. So, um, yeah, it can be said that it led down the path, and it can be said that we were all thieves, but were we thieves? Um, in the original, in the in the original games, the original concept of that, we weren't stealing from anybody that was alive. Or that wasn't evil. We, you know, we weren't going around and robbing villages and stuff, though. Though, um, yeah, Jolly's gone. Jolly Blackburn's gone down that uh, that road with his uh, group of uh, the Knights at the dinner table in a different context. But yeah, no, actually, he's done it in both contexts. Anyway, um, the thief was there to. Uh, help figure out how to get the idol away that we were all trying to get. We weren't stealing it from anybody alive. We were either hoping to sell it to somebody, make a lot out of it, or hack it up into, you know. It, it's, um, it's, ar it, I, it's arguable that uh, we were all thieves. We were all adventurers looking for things. Now, finding a treasure and having somebody try to make an 800 year claim on it or something uh some ancestor no uh -uh, that's not thievery that's it that's being a wise adventurer um a, a clever adventurer but yeah thieves these were problematic the name went to rogue okay and the rogue um there's so many so many tropes or, or stereotypes for a rogue everybody from the saint 
who was certainly not one. Um, there, there's, there's uh, Kugel and and Fafford or the Mauser actually, and um, there's been so many other characters that that fudged around um, what was good and what wasn't, uh, and whose idea of good prevails. But anyway, yeah, you can make the argument that it was a problem, but not that much. And except for the fact that you might be right, it might have led to skills. Ooh. Uh, apologies if you covered this. Any thoughts on variable hit dice and weapon damage? There's an elegance to just D6. One being that there isn't necessarily an optimal weapon choice. What do you use? I use variable as soon as it came out. Now, when I bought the first set, I just bought the three books. I didn't have Greyhawk. And we used the, the sixes. And my guys right away were going, oh, this is this is kind of silly. Um, if you if you accept the concept that the hit points are the ability to evade the killing blow, why should you have the same uh, potential of inflicting the killing blow with a dagger that you would have with a spear or or, or, or a sword, with short sword, long sword, whatever. If there was a certain, and again, remember, this was picked up and initially played by miniatures players and uh, board gamers, and there was a an intrinsic, uh, that just doesn't seem right. So I favor the uh, variable damage for weapon type. Um, just because um, certain we dodging certain weapon types is certainly different than dodging other weapon types, or catching it on your shield, or you know, however you you uh, um, equate the hit points inflicted with before you you croak. Um, and people people got to choose weapons. I don't know that it was not necessarily because they were, the, they were the optimum weapons, but they were the weapons they liked. I played a dwarf so I could use an axe. I don't recall ever playing characters that used swords. I always favored axes. I don't know why. Could be I'm part Irish and part Swede. I don't know. Um, hey, Tim, any thoughts on Dungeon Magazine? Great videos, mate. You and yours say, stay safe, kind of regards. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I don't have any. Uh, I didn't see it when it was new. And um, I don't know that I've ever, I've ever looked at uh, an issue. It, it just hasn't crossed my radar. I know it was out there. I understand that many people thought highly of it. That's all I can say. Um, Ta that talk of anachronistic modern sci-fi technology and fantasy RPG reminds me of Dave Ironson's Temple of the Frog. Okay, I always liked the idea of Stephen the Rock as an evil Captain Kirk with power armor stranded on a primitive world and just going with the flow, enjoying being a cult leader. I find that kind of genre bashing, as long as it's not overdone, can evoke a sense of a much larger campaign setting universe. I remember run running games for those teen for these teens as soon as they realized outer space was a thing in my campaign, they wanted to figure out how to get to figure out how to get to Earth. Cool. Um, I've written um, Pillar of Fire, I think I, I it was called. Um, it's it's written. I I wrote it several years ago. It just needs to be fleshed out some. Where uh, there's a mysterious uh, tower that appears. And it's not it's not sure if it's a if it's a really super high high powered wizard who's come to pillage the countryside and, and loot it of whatever he wants, or if it's uh, their extraterrestrials that have uh, on a uh, reconnaissance mission to this new planet. There's um, sort of robot droid thingy, sort of, but they could be they could just be uh, automatons, clockwork men. Um, there, there, there is a collection inside this thing that could or could be a, 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 a rocket, could be a magical uh, tower, and there's uh, collections of artifacts and stuff by type. So you never, you never know for sure what what they're uh, there for. So yeah, that's a, that's kind of a mashup. Okay, all right. I've been catching up for the last few weeks. Thanks for sharing.
Um, I started playing in 82 with the Volve BBX, BEX, oh, oh, yeah, basing, okay, in addition, before we drifted into ad and D, I I used to get three pounds pocket money and used to have to save to buy modules and usually got the hardbacks for birthdays or Christmas presents. When we had enough saved to buy something, we'd head over to the toy or hobby store and spend about 30 minutes scouring through the affordable books and modules before making a purchase. As we shared DMing, you'd have to buy a module that no one else had or had already run. All of the modules were shrink wrapped, so you were sold on the title, artwork, and the blurb. Yes. <laughs> I'll never forget the day that I spent my five pounds on Brian Bloom's Rogues Gallery. What a disappointment. Was this a vanity release on Brian Bloom's part? Um, also, was there any reason that you never published a module with TSR? Thanks again for your videos. Um, you're welcome. Yeah, that was a big vi vanity thing on Brian's part. Um, <laughs> again, I I have no idea the inner dynamics of their contract and their stock agreements, and I know that there was tussles going on, and it may have been a sop that Gary threw to Brian to get him off his back for a while. Um, and yeah, it was a great... A ton, a ton of a, a ton of disappointment in a in a small package. Was there any reason that you never published a module with TSR? Yeah, I never wrote a module when I was with TSR. I play tested them. I helped. Uh, uh, I helped in the testing, but that was not my thing. I was hired to be the company editor. Then I, which included being the editor of Strategic Review, with the intent of spinning it off. Yada da da da, which we later did. Um. So uh, that's why I never wrote one. Um, the boy now here, somebody's ladling it on thick. Finding this channel was the best thing I've discovered on the internet. I started playing in the early 90s. <laughs> Better than, than high class porn? Wow. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm honored. Um, I started playing in the early 90s. I was no more than 10. My dad would DM my friends and I in AD&D. &D. As that was what he played, we very quickly became hooked, and by the time we were 13 or so, we were looking around game shops for modules and source books that my dad did not own and quickly figured out not many stores carried anything for AD&D anymore. One day, we went to our local store just looking for minis, and the owner started to recognize us. He bought in his entire personal AD&D collection and sold us for about 40 bucks. It included another set of books, including the Wilderness and Deities, books which we are looking for, and about 20 modules. Man, what a score. Um, from the Giant Series, Expert Series, Slavers, Tomb of Horrors, etc., etc. I mean, it was a gold mine that gave us content for many years, and I'll never forget that shop or the owner. To this day, myself, my dad, and the same friends, with some new ones, play in the same world with the same foundation of AD&D rules. That's kind of what finding Tim, that's, that's kind of what finding Tim and not being, and being asked him to ask, oh, okay, oh, geez, it is getting thick. That's kind of what finding Tim and being able to ask him questions feels like. My inner child has had many questions over the years with no one, no one to answer them. Ha ha. Thank you. All right, now we're going to get into one of the stranger ones here. Not that most of these aren't somewhere along the scale, um, the spectrum. Uh, here's some group effort, world building, and creative writing project ideas. I was thinking that maybe a method of rewarding level advancement, experience points, skills, and feats would be to encourage the players to write stories and ideas what their character's off-adventure training routine is like. That is to say, a description about the school, mentors, guild, hierarchy, and or senior instructors, <coughs> or skill building activities are like. For example, perhaps a player with a fighter might write a description of the fantasy health club or gym. <coughs> um, well, right off, no, I don't favor that because it involves writing and not everybody has equal um, skill at writing. And so, um, no, I, I don't, I don't like that. For one thing, I don't, I never, ever got into training. 
No, you don't go trying to get, no. By the time you get there and you accumulate that, you've built more muscle, you've learned more, no, you don't need training. You don't, you know, it's no, you know, Conan going to the East and learning from the masters. Uh-uh. Just not anything I ever believed in. If you do, that's fine. Okay. Whatever. I didn't, for one thing, I didn't want to take my character out of three or five or six weeks out of the rotation of the campaigns that we were playing in while I went and trained. Nah, garbage. My opinion, your mileage may vary. And again, you're asking, you're asking people to do something that may, number one, they may not feel confident. They might be a good writer, but they don't feel confident. Um, are you, as a DM, skilled enough to um, read bad stuff, poorly written, or not as well written as you, you might write it, or whatever? No, I, that's putting a burden on the players that um, they might be very verbal, they might be very active as a member of the group, but ask them to write that, and, and they, get, they freeze up like some people do before a test. So I don't know that that'd be equally fair to everybody, but that's my opinion. Still enjoying the mostly weekly trips down memory lane. Hard to, been, hard to believe it's been over three years now. Another magic missile question for you. When using Greyhawk rules, if your magic user can cast multiple missiles, say a six level magic user casting three, do you roll a number of dice equal to the number of missiles, or do you roll one die and multiply by the number of magic missiles so that each missile does the same damage? I've always done the multiple dice, one for each missile. I clicked on a YouTube video titled The Truth About D&D's Magic Missiles May Surprise You, not realizing that it was 5e, but I watched it at the end. Apparently, according to 5e, uh, magic missile is now treated as an area effect spell when multiple targets are selected. For example, fireball, where each one being in the area effect takes the same damage, or half if they make their saving throws. So only one die is rolled and each missile does the same damage. The host of the video said he talked with one of 5 E's authors, well there's a mistake, uh, who confirmed that the one die method is correct and who added that for consistency, the one die rule also applies even if the magic user directs all the missiles at the same target. I thought, okay, sounds a bit screwy, but it is fifth. Then I read the comments and more than one person said something along the lines of, I've been playing since 1982, we've always rolled just one die. Uh, what is your recollection for the intent for rolling damage for magic missiles? Okay, I believe that the original in, inter, interpretation of the rules is written and there were a lot of interpretations um, you could um, go either way one die multiple dice but I think it mostly led you to believe that it was a die and that they all did that which is part of the reason I abhorred them I thought that, you know, at the time, Magic Missile, even for a 5th or 6th level uh, Magic user, was like a very erratic mortar barrage. They It either came down on Tarkin and just killed the shit out of everything there, or it missed altogether and wasn't worth, you know, it was like throwing firecrackers. Um at least with multiple dice, if there's three missiles, three dice, at least you got a, uh, you, your average roll should be 10.5 total damage. So, and, you know, you've got the law of averages going for you where if it's one die, oh crap, two points, big deal. Saving throws, half damage, and whatever. Um, Saving throws have always been a funny thing. I never really liked uh, the rules as written about saving throws and poison, but we're going to talk about poison later, and I'll, I'll, I'll elaborate at that time. Um, <clears throat> Got to keep the throat lubricated. Okay, I'd like to add my two cents to rolling out in the open conversation. 
I take it a hybrid approach. I roll for treasure in random encounters behind the screen so I can maintain a certain level of control there. Very good idea. Especially if you're concerned with inflation. I also t tend to create stuff, curate that stuff so it's less of an issue. But I will roll for attacks and damage out in the open. Okay, nothing to do with lack of trust on the player's part, but it, in your, in, it instead adds to the tension of the combat. It also adds to my fun as a DM. I'm not trying to kill you. The monsters are. I'm seeing these roles for the first time, too. Great point. Much like, hey, it's not my fault. <laughs> you rolled it yourself. Um, I'm, I'm okay with that. What finally convinced me to do that is I realized if you're rolling those behind the screen, then the dice are just making noise and giving you a suggestion. If they come up with a 20 and you didn't want to hit that character, then the dice didn't matter then, nor will the next roll matter. Good point. Can't fudge what rolls in the open. 20. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Your shit went bad today. It's a little sour. All right. Now, this is... This is this is uh, two parts from the same person. They were separated by a couple of comments. My friend knows a lot about Dragonlance and has hinted at DMing a game based there. But when he has told us so far, we have, we have determined that he's going to be very harsh upon divine casters. How would a cleric, paladin, or such get prayers granted in a realm where the deities have abandoned all hope and left the world to, to its own device? And then... A couple comments later, and if all such effort is futile, then why bother? I mean, he is a numbers cruncher, and I feel the fighter and rogue types will be taking lots of damage. Without healing and very limited mage powers, too, it seems to us players in that game that we are doomed to beforehand. Are we wrong in our theory? Probably not. I just, I just mentioned previously about rolling... Uh, dice and expecting average returns, etc. You can do the same thing here, projecting in your head. If just rolling average dice, how many hit points you're likely to take, and how long it's going to take to uh, heal those back if you don't have a cleric, you know, saying prayers for you in that. Now, if there, if healing potions are just like, you know, Red Bulls available everywhere, well, that could compensate. You know, everybody's running around with a little red, you know, the old, remember the old five-hour energy drinks? Hey, I feel better. Okay, so uh, it's the same thing. Red Bull's like a hay spell. Um, otherwise, you're right. And, and and frankly, and and I know these these I know the question writer here personally, and I've met some of his players over uh, from a few years back. And no, I wouldn't even bother. I just say to the individual, nah, it doesn't interest me. Um, that world that world setting, I'm not interested in. Because you know, life's too short to play in crappy games. Um. It, it, it is interesting, though, to contemplate a campaign setting where the gods haven't absolutely abandoned, but the, ten, the, the link is so tenuous that only great deeds will, will attract them. But if it does attract them, the rewards will therefore be great also. Just a thought. Okay. I asked, I said something last week, but I don't really know what this is I'm doing. And I'm told today it's a vlog. I guess that's how you pronounce it, V-L-O-G, vlog. Because a podcast is something you download and listen to later. Okay, well, fine. Did you, did or do you use critical roles of from one or 20 being something extra? I used them, but probably not in the way you might expect. I used them for um, humor. My humor, <laughs> players didn't always think it was so funny, but if somebody, you know, rolled a really crappy number like a one, oh man, not only did you miss, but you swung completely around, knocked one leg off that, that uh, brazier full of glowing coals, 
and uh, there's hot coals all over the floor all around you, and you've set the rug on fire. Not that he swung and missed and the axe bounced off the pillar and chopped his foot off. Never like that. On a 20, same thing. You know, I, I'm when it's on the player's behalf, same thing. You not only hit him, you cut his whole damn leg off. He's now hopping around on one leg and bleeding out. And you don't say how fast he's bleeding out or whatever, but obviously the next hits are going to be lots easier because he's hopping around on one leg. Now, that's the only time that I used hit locations was when it was to my advantage, to my humor, to, to the picture I was going to paint. All right. Otherwise, I wasn't into really into hit location as such. Now, if the players are going, well, I'm going to sneak up and cut his left foot off with my axe of, of, of slicing, different thing, different different concept. But, yeah, I, I recognize good rolls and bad rolls, 20s. To be honest, um, I think probably in the second game that, that Dave played or Gary played, um, it took about two games to realize that 20s and 1s were special in different ways. Okay, a new definition. What is a YouTube channel? I don't know that I asked this one, I guess. Well, I have one. A YouTube a, a channel is a member's personal presence on YouTube, similar to the social media sites, other social media sites. Select another member's name to visit the person's personal channel. This is Tim's YouTube channel, and he is an RPA, RPG influencer, among other things. Oh, does it say that? Somebody else must have written that. Um, okay, here we go back with hit points. Some people just can't let a sleeping dog lie. I'm not so much modeling specific fictional narratives with my treatment of hit points as pointing to tropes in the genres of fiction this game is founded in to illustrate how you make sense of what a character having a whole lot of hit points really means. We already know that interpret a non-fatal loss of hit points in a fight to mean the character dodged or parried or took the blow on his shield or armor, winding, wounding them, whatever. I was merely using the imagined swords and sorcery scenario as a way of interpreting what non-fatal loss of hit points means in some sort of assassination attempt. We already extend the hit point abstraction beyond the basic scenario of Malie. Imagine a magic user lobs a fireball at a powerful foe and fails to do enough damage to take him out, save for half or not. I always wondered about that fireball save for half or not. I guess you got behind a table or something. I mean, you're still going to get somewhat roasty, toasty. Um, if that's for a foe, if that foe's a high level fighter, does their hit points mean they can literally withstand being engulfed in an explosion, comparable to a bomb going off at their feet, or do we have a re or do we rather interpret their high hit points to mean they are lucky, skilled enough to dive to cover as the last moment, managed to avoid being immolated this time? Yeah. They managed to evade the fatal blow. Now, if they had 100 pump points and took 92, I imagine they've had one side of their beard singed off, and um, so they're they're got a lot of smoke damage and some scorching and and what have you going on and. They're certainly in no shape to run a foot race. Uh, eight points or not, I wouldn't allow it. Because unless they had a constitution of at least 16, I'm going to have them <laughs> wheezing for a while after that. Um, but I still, you know, if a creature, man or beast, is asleep and you manage to approach them by whatever means necessary I mean come on if you're sound asleep I can kill you with a chopstick just poke it through your eyeball into your brain you're dead I don't care how big or beefy and burly you are that's all it takes hat pin Poke it through the eye into the brain and wiggle it a little bit. Dead. So yeah, the hit points are worthless. 
when the person when the creature is defenseless if the evil bad guy captures the big muscular fighter and binds him up with chains and the big muscular fighter tries a couple of times and fails to break him loose then yeah the big bad evil guy can have his way with the fighter and kill him good reason not to get captured by the big bad evil guy my opinion yours may vary when I was young I lost many thieves to save or die poison I have a folder full of dead thieves that all met this fate missing fine missing fine trap rolls getting pricked by needles or croaking a cloud of gas now that I'm DMing my own group and as an adult, I find it difficult to subject my thief players to the same fate, but still want poison to be powerful and something to respect. Paralyzed effect is certainly debilitating enough on its own, but only having one effect for poison doesn't feel like enough. Do you see any rules around poison? Do you use any rules around your table of poison that may or may not be our outline of the DMG? Um, I have a couple of ideas messing around with, but I hear your take. Well, there are several, if you get real scientific about it, there are several types of poisons. They do several, they, they cause several reactions or failures in your body. Um, make the save and it doesn't kill you. I can, you, you can be catatonic for one to seven, you know, two to seven days. Um, you can be um, half speed, you know, reduced to half movement and bumping into trees because your vision's been affected. Um, there's, there's a, you could do anything with the side effect of anything kind of poison you want because there's so many different kinds of poisons that can kill you in so many different ways. Some of them may stop your breathing. Some of them stop your uh, nervous reaction. Some of them make your blood cells burst. Well, feel free. I always wondered about the save half for poison. You, I always felt you're poisoned or not, but some people do survive being bit. They may lose a finger or a toe or part of their foot or something from ne necro you know, flesh necropsy. You know, but um, okay, but that doesn't mean that you can't, as a DM, though you, your snakes do this. Okay, if you do manage to save and it doesn't kill you, you're going to have vertigo for three to thirty-six hours. And that means that you better retreat from the adventure. You might not be able to do it on your own. It's it's a big monkey wrench in the party's plans. Go for it. Your snakes, your lizards, your spiders can do, their venom can do whatever you want them to do. You could have a spider that bit you in the middle of the night, cause you to wake up like you just had a big whooping a uh, lung full of laughing gas and 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 just laugh yourself silly um you're like you just had a big hit of helium and you high-pitched voice that wakes up everything within a kilometer or two around you at night go for it you know um that that's a great place to be creative Okay, here again, I disagree with your killing, your ruling and killing deep sleeping characters with a single blow. Well, I've already told you why. I can kill you with a single blow. I don't care if you're six foot two, 240 pounds, and buff as a, as a linebacker. If you're dead asleep and I can get up next to you in the, in the bed or wherever you're sleeping, I can run a chopstick through your eyeball into your head. Right through the, where the optic nerve passes through, right into your brain. And you are dead. And so if a character is asleep, they effectively have one hit point. Yes. Hit points are to avoid a fatal blow in a combat. In fighting. Accidents. 
falling out of a tree, trying to climb a wall and falling or whatever. How close did it come to killing you? You're asleep. You got no defense. The hat pin will do it. A lady's hat pin about as long as the edge of that piece of paper is more than enough to go through your eyeball into the back of your and hit the back of your skull. Easy peasy. In D&D, dip that bugger in that poison I, we just talked about. And on the off chance it didn't kill you, it'll kill you. I don't care if it's an ochre. I don't care if it's a pixie. If you can get up next to them while they're sound asleep. Now, that ought to be kind of hard. There were a couple of replies to this one. If you're asleep, how do you avoid the fatal blow? I tend to, and there's a second one. I tend to agree if someone is defenseless, it's pretty easy to finish them. My magic users tend to abuse alarm spell to help, help with stuff like this. Okay. Um, you have to. Okay, we're playing in a fantasy, but you have to, you have to apply some sort of real life reality, physics, physiognomy, biology. You have to. Or you can go play a, a, a space game or a post-apocalyptic game, and then anything works. But even it has an, an exterior logic and an interior logic. Okay. To the person who said he was going to go to Texas. No, I don't live in Texas. I'd go to Texas before anywhere else because it's obviously where I'd find the most amount of fellow gamers in person. And this is a violation of things that I've said many, many, many times. And we're going to be dealing with this violation and others. Uh, the, not hypercatechs, nor mask wearers, nor frightened about government and social distancing demands. I can't play any other way. I can't play D and D over over Zoom, online over Zoom. Any other way totally defeats the purpose. Well, I guess that depends on what the purpose of playing the game is. If it's punching each other on the shoulder, no, you can't do that. If it's getting together, it doesn't have to be in the same room. It can be done online. I've been doing a lot of it online. It's a lot of fun. Is it the same as being in the same room? No. But it's still a ton of fun. If you can't do it that way, okay. That's your issue. We'll talk more. That's all, That all said, thank you for your positive reviews of the North Texas RPG scene. There's a part of me that's really wanting to connect with gamers. We have a rich tra tradition of storytelling and novelists from the South, William Faulkner, etc., Robert E. Howard, and many others. Here's a plug for Texas Gamer, Texan Gamer, Matt Finch's work, Tumbleweed Adventure Design. And I'm a big fan of Matt Finch's. As a matter of fact, his last Swords and Witches read the introduction, the last edition, the I wrote the introduction for it because I believe it's an excellently done system. Um, how could that storytelling tradition not translate into brilliant GM telling, GM talent that's inspiring? What do you think about that observation of Southerners from Texas and all over the deep Southern states? I think they're probably pretty good gamers, just like pretty much everybody else. Where people with talent live, I don't believe there's any magic water in any state. People uh, end up living not where they were born. So if there was magic water in one state, and you grew up in magic water state that, and moved to another, no. Sorry, I, I don't mean to ridicule you. Uh, uh, it's just that, no, I haven't seen that. Okay, now. We're going to talk about something that I don't normally talk about. As you well know, I have done everything I can to keep politics out of this. Facebook other 
videos that I've made under 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 other titles have addressed various political things over the last couple of years. I've never injected politics into this. I have gagged on the blood from the bitten tongues, but no. You claim to have ended the wor absolute worst part of D&D &D and yet feel like telling people to wear a mask. Stick to RPG material and keep your political ideas to yourself. Yes, some people think masks are political. I'm going to go on a rant here and I'm, I'm really, 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 really holding it back right now. Because I wanted to let loose for so long. I, I close my program, show, video, whatever, vlog, every week with advice. Because I believe in science. I have taught science. I believed in science. I have not drunk the Kool-Aid about conspiracies concerning the vaccines and all this stuff. I believe in science. Now, we're going to go on here before I... I'm locked and loaded. I just haven't pulled the lanyard yet. Response to that. It's his show. Don't like it. Don't watch it, baby. I love his show, just not his politics. Again, I didn't know that. See, I got this big sappy idea that I'm mostly speaking to my friends every week. My friends being other gamers. And so I'm wishing my friends good health. All right. Next one says, not political to wear a mask, just common sense. I'm not a fan of dying or dumbasses. Wearing a mask is not living in fear. Using oven mitts is not living in fear of my oven. I stole that on Facebook. But the, the, the sentiment is correct. I believe in science. All those years of schooling I've had, all those degrees I've gotten, I believe in science. Political? No. No, 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 no. Um, I never once got on here and talked about corporal bone spurs. I never once got on here and ranted about how he absolutely enraged every veteran out there when he called them suckers and losers when veter visiting the veterans cemetery. I never once brought up all his endless golf trips. I never once brought up his ridiculous hairdo and his orange face. I never once brought up the thousands of lies that he told the American public in four years. Let's see. I never once commented on the fact that the man didn't even know how to wear a necktie. I didn't bring that up once, ever. I didn't even bring up January 6th, I don't believe which in my lifetime is the worst thing I've ever seen in this country. Didn't. Haven't. Not once. Now I could go on and list 800 other things that I never once brought up about politics. But I think I made my point. His response. It is politics. Viruses don't go away. Are you going to wear a mask for the rest of your life? I'm going to use oven mitts for the rest of my life every time I need to. 
Are you going to demand everyone wear a mask for the rest of their lives? No, I'm not going to demand anything. I can't. Um, I saw a picture on Facebook three days ago of a Major League Baseball game that was being played in this fall of 1918. Now, first thing you notice about that is guys used to go to watch baseball games in the afternoon because there weren't night games, wearing their suits and their, their fedoras and whatever. There were several Army uh, members of the Armed Forces there with their uh, Smokey the Bear hats and everything. And you know what? Every single one of them had a face mask on because it was the middle of the pandemic. How did we get so stupid in a hundred years? How did that happen? Um, viruses don't go away. No, they don't. They continue to mutate. And with luck, most of them end up mutating into something that's harmless. Just like flu mutates every year and you have to get a new flu shot. If you don't get flu shots, I guess you like getting sick or running the risk and rolling the dice or getting sick. So, okay, don't get a flu shot. I wear a mask. I've had my shots. I've, I'm fully vaccinated. Why do I wear a mask? Because I may have had somebody breathe on me who is positive, who does carry it. I'm carrying it but won't get it, but by wearing a mask, I don't I don't spray it over at you. It's not politics, it's science. It's science. Um okay, now here we go. Are you going to demand everywhere in America? Okay. The virus was used to win an election, nothing more. The people this guy votes for believe in depopulation. They will use this and other measures to get rid of you and your, your family. Depopulation? Uh, yeah, okay. And so one of the persons asked that. Do you mean the people with brains in their skulls and who wear their masks to prevent the spread of this virus are, are in favor of depopulation or, or they are depopulation proponents? I'd ask you if I'd ask if you think before you type this dribble if I was at all in doubt as what the answer is. Okay. So this person showed his hand, got stomped on by several other people. And then there was a follow up way at the end. I thought about Tim I never caught the bit about Tim creating the worst part of D and B. I created the psionic system. It works, but I will admit it's extremely difficult to understand and figure out. But it does work. I wouldn't have created a system that didn't work. I just couldn't make a less complicated one at the time. Okay, and then I got one more thing to close off on tonight. And this is a suggestion for Kickstarter. And I hope that none of you that are listening to this do this. But... I, get, I don't know if every Kickstarter, but there there is a, can do this, but I've seen it often enough. There is a thing that if you pledge just a dollar, you can say, I support you. Actually, you can pay a dollar and be the biggest asshole you want to be because you paid a dollar. It's like buying a ticket to be an asshole. So then you can rip the project before you've even seen it, rip the creators, Rip anybody who wants to say good things about this project or the creators. Kickstarter or anybody that's going to kickstart, do away from that. You don't need those dollars, one dollar at a time, because you run the risk of getting an asshole who's paid his dollar and now can be a troll. Oh, I got my troll license. No, I haven't done a kickstarter. Some of my friends have. They've been successful for the most part. But that has always bugged me. I can pay a dollar and be a troll and just rip you up one side and down the other. Weird. Now, any totally non-political suggested advice to those who believe in science and wish to remain healthy and not die... Next week, oh, I, before that, next weekend, I will be running games Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday night 
for Gary Kahn, virtually, on Zoom. I will make a curmudgeon Friday night after I finish my Zoom game because the timing will correspond. So um, I don't expect to miss a beat. That one will be 165 because this one's 164. Now I'll go back to my purely. I want all gamers to be healthy. I believe you will be the healthiest if we all wear a mask, sneeze into our elbow, wash our hands a lot, and love one another. Do 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 Welcome to my cellar. He's the curmudgeon who wrote about the dungeons. Now he's the feller, live from the cellar. Talks about D&D and old school RPGs. Still quite a feller, the curmudgeon in the cellar. Last man around when the race went down. Calling Gary in that Lake Geneva town. Hey Gary, it's an awful mess. Let me edit, we'll have success. D and D and Dragon Magazine. He's the curmudgeon who wrote about the dungeons. Now he's the feller, live from the cellar. Talks about D and D and old school RPGs, but still what the feller, the curmudgeon in the cellar. Magic missile, it's a mortar shell. Make it hit in the first level spell. From psionics to the game, you attack that wizard's brain. DSR and fantasy, collection of micro armory. Tight with tramp under a tree. High as could be. He's the curmudgeon who wrote about the dungeons. Now he's the feller, live from the cellar. Talks about D&D and old school RPGs, but he's still quite the feller, the curmudgeon in the cellar. Still quite the feller, the curmudgeon in the cellar. Curmudgeon.